word, transparency. As we continue to reckon with policing in America and the many ways black and brown people are harmed, transparency is the foundation for any hopes of police reform. Just think about the last few high profile cases we've covered. The death of George Floyd was horrible, but it was the leaked video of the incident followed by countless angles of body camera footage during the trial that not only galvanized the public, but kept the momentum alive for nearly a year. In nearby Chicago, just reading about the police shooting of 13 year old Adam Toledo was enough to infuriate the people there but it was the body camera video of the teenager dropping his weapon less than a second before he was shot that led to protests all across the country. And in both of these cases, the release of the footage directly contradicted initial reports by the police about what happened. There is a reason why one of the provisions in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act requires that all police officers wear body cameras. Because that footage, that immediate transparency, gives the public a reason to trust the police. And it can be key to holding police accountable. Which brings us to Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Andrew Brown Jr. was fatally shot by police there on Wednesday. Police have released few details of the shooting, but say they were attempting to serve Brown a drug-related search warrant. Witnesses say he was shot in the back while attempting to flee. Under a 2016 North Carolina law, the sheriff's office has to obtain a court order before releasing body camera video to the public. The head of the sheriff's department says the request is pending approval. But the family of Brown can see the footage without a court order. And after several delays by police to redact parts of the footage, Brown's son and one single attorney were allowed to see only 20 seconds of the video. Here's what they say police showed them. Let's be clear. This was an execution. Oh, I know it. Andrew Brown was in his driveway. Mm -hmm. The sheriff uh, truck blocked him in his driveway, mm -hmm. so he could not exit his driveway. Mm -hmm. right. Andrew had his hands on his steering wheel. Mm -hmm. He was not reaching for anything. He wasn't touching anything. He wasn't throwing anything around. He had his hands firmly on the steering wheel. They run up to his vehicle shooting. Oh. Oh. Yep. Yep. Sure did. He still stood there, sat there in his vehicle with his hands on the steering wheel while being shot at. He finally so decides to try to get away yeah. and he backs out, not going towards the officers at all. Uh -huh. There was at no time in the 20 seconds that we saw where he was threatening the officers in any kind of way. Right. Come on. That's right. He was trying to evade being shot. Yes. My dad got executed just by trying to save his own life. Yeah. You know, he was not in no, the, the officers was not in no harm of him at all. It's just messed up how this happened. So that's where we are. We still don't know what's on the complete footage because none of it has been released to the public. But based on the family's account and based on them saying they were shown only 20 seconds of the video, there's a reason to think it doesn't put the police in the best light. Plus, there's information that we do have. Like how Brown's aunt told reporters that authorities said they didn't find any drugs or weapons in his car. And how seven deputies have already been placed on leave in the aftermath of the shooting. And perhaps the biggest sign that something upsetting may be on the video is that the mayor of Elizabeth City has declared a state of emergency in anticipation of, quote, a period of civil unrest following the release of the footage. Joining me now is Marilyn Mosby, state's attorney for the city of Baltimore. She's the youngest chief prosecutor of any major American city. Also with us is Mark Claxton, a re retired NYPD detective and director of the Black Law Enforcement Agency. Marilyn, I'm going to start with you as a prosecutor. I'm curious what your thoughts are about the apparent barriers to police transparency in North Carolina. I had never heard of a law like this before, and it seems very strange for there to be an extra barrier uh, to transparency in, in situations where police have used lethal force. So the one thing I can say is defined by the ABA ethical standards of profession, prosecutors can't typically release extrajudicial statements. Extrajudicial statements are inclusive of social media, oral, written, and visual presentations that have the ability of prejudicing the defendant. 
right? And so what you will typically find though, and, and, and the worse the conduct is, it's harder to be not be prejudicial. However, prosecutors don't control the police. And the police, often in the interest of transparency, as you've already indicated, release that video. So it would seem to me in a place like North Carolina, where you have the body-worn cameras that have to go through a court and a judicial order, that they would already have those systems and those protocols in place, especially in instances where they foresee that the video will cause some sort of scenario that it's currently causing. And just to follow up on that point, Marilyn, it seems to me that if the video, sh okay, so say the video showed uh, the police officer clearly, you know, acting appropriately, I feel like that would have been released immediately. And so that the family only has seen 20 seconds to this, at this point, Marilyn, is that an indication that there's probably a lot bad on that video? So what I can say, and I am of the opinion that, and, and follow the standards of 21st century prosecution model, that absent a showing that it would hinder the investigation or it would be prejudicial to the defendant, it should be released, especially in, in understanding the distrust when it comes to black people in this country. And let's just be candid. People want to know our system of justice works for everyone. And it doesn't feel that way. And it hasn't felt that way. You know, a day after the Chauvin verdict, we're now dealing with another black man that has been killed in, by the police. And we don't know. We, we, there's some reports that he was shot in the back, some reports that he was shot in the head. And it's completely unacceptable that the family would not be able to, to know how their loved one was killed. Absolutely. Mark, last time uh, we had you on uh, last week, we spoke about police training and, and you said something that has stayed with me since you said it, which is police training is not the problem. Police training does not uh, create, you know, better police training does not create a scenario where officers are like, oh, my training tells me not to run up on people's cars and shoot them as they're driving away. I mean, that doesn't feel like anything that is part of training. So in this particular case, with the set of facts that we actually know, um, is it an indication to you as a former officer that there's potentially bad, th there are potentially very bad things on this video, otherwise the police would have released it. Um, you know, the, the reports are that he was shot as he was trying to flee, which that's a whole Supreme Court case. I thought police can't shoot you in the back. You, that, that's part of the problem uh, that we have nationwide. Uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, from state to state, from locale to locale, there's such a wide range of variation in what is acceptable or lawful police procedure that it becomes confusing. What's becoming really clear is that um, in, in North Carolina, it seems as if they're not only not situationally aware, they're not aware of the current climate and circumstances around the rest of the country, but they're operating as if they are in the land that time forgot. And in any other profession, when you know better, you do better. But when policing is so mired in the muck of toxicity and a toxic culture, it becomes reflexively defensive and stubborn and defiant. And, and common sense just shuts down. What they're actually doing is exacerbating tensions, they're sowing seeds of distrust that are going to come back and bite them in short order, I might I add. And they're agitating a situation that's already very tense and, 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 and frustrating. It's inexcusable what's occurring there in North Carolina. Also, Marilyn, in, in a lot of ways, this, this feels like a case, cases we've seen before. I'm thinking back to um, the case of Walter, Sc Walter Scott, um, who was shot in the back while fleeing the police, and they didn't tell the truth about what transpired in that case until the video came out and we saw what actually happened. You know, how much of a difference would having a video immediately help in terms of the trust piece that Mark just mentioned uh, and whether prosecutors uh, can press charges quickly um, so that the unrest, maybe there is an unrest that's even able to unfold because there's full transparency and an active investigation to hold someone accountable if there is wrongdoing on that video. 
So I think that that's key. I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the most vital piece of evidence that the, the prosecution had, Keith Ellison in the Chauvin trial, was that piece of evidence, that video evidence that could not be contradicted. And at the end of the day, that is what has taken America to stop being willfully ignorant to the black experience when it comes to our engagement with law enforcement. You know, the, these this idea, this culture of violence, this culture of overly dominant police enforcement against black people for these low level offenses that have nothing to do with public safety. Freddie Gray merely made eye contact with police in a high crime neighborhood and decided to run. Sandra Bland refused, she failed to put on a turn signal. Eric Garner allegedly was selling loose cigarettes. George Floyd, coming out of that, he failed, he was allegedly passing a counterfeit bill during a global pandemic for groceries. Dante Wright may have had air fresheners in their car. And so what we know is that, yes, body, that transparency and that in, in, ensuring accountability is key. And it, 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 it hasn't happened prior to I, iPhones and, and cameras. Absolutely. And hopefully um, we won't need all of this transparency, but uh, because there will be fewer police killings with systemic change. But right now, the, the videos are helpful in, you know, corroborating uh, whatever side's account is correct, right? I mean, I think what, all, what we're all looking for is the truth um, and accountability if, if it's necessary. Attorney Mosby and Mark Claxton, thank you so much for being here tonight. It was a really important conversation. Please stay safe. If you needed proof of just how different President Biden's view of police oversight is from his predecessor, look no further than the Justice Department. Back in 2018, Trump's Attorney General Jeff Sessions instructed the Justice Department to limit federal interventions into local police departments. The move effectively discouraged federal oversight. During the four years of the Trump administration, they launched a single investigation, that's a grand total of one, into a police department. The Obama administration launched 25 over the course of eight years. Now compare that to the Biden Justice Department. Attorney General Merrick Garland has already reversed the Trump directive on consent decrees, which made it harder to hold police departments accountable for civil rights abuses. And one day after the Chauvin verdict, Garland announced an investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. Now today, a year after the fatal police shooting of Breonna Taylor, the Attorney General announced another federal investigation, this time into the Louisville Metro Police Department. The investigation will assess whether LMPD engages in a pattern or practice of using unreasonable force, including with respect to people involved in peaceful, expressive activities. It will determine whether LMPD engages in unconstitutional stops, searches, and seizures, as well as whether the department unlawfully executes search warrants on private homes. It will also assess whether LMPD engages in discriminatory conduct on the basis of race or fails to provide public services that comply with the Americans with Disability Act. Joining me now is Minnesota Senator Tina Smith. Senator, what do you make of this renewed interest in investigating local police departments by the federal government? It's a big change from the previous administration. Well, hi, Zerlina. It's great to be with you again. And this is good news. This is exactly what the Justice Department should be doing. I mean, let's be honest. Donald Trump treated the Justice Department like it was his own personal law firm. And instead, what they ought to be doing is making sure that our civil rights laws and that all of our laws um, are being enforced. You know, gosh, when uh, back almost a year ago, I called on the Department of Justice to initiate a pattern and practice investigation um, with the Minneapolis Police Department to really look at the policies and the training and the procedures that uh, make up the Minneapolis Police Department to understand what about those is discriminatory. So I'm glad that this is happening. You know, in the meantime, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights has also initiated an investigation, and I'm looking forward to those two investigations working together because what we have to have is systemic change. And uh, this, I believe, will help to get us to that place. So in the last segment, we were talking about transparency. And it feels to me, that especially in hindsight, when you look at 
the video that we now have all seen of what happened to George Floyd and the original police account of what they said happened to George Floyd. I mean, the disconnect, it's almost, it, it would be funny if we were talking about something funny. It's not funny, of course, because we're talking about something deadly serious. Um, but it was, it was almost comical to look at their explanation of what they say happened versus the truth. And, um, you know, th these investigations are, are hopefully going to help renew trust between people in, and the police. Do you think that that's ultimately a part of the goal here? I think that the, I think it absolutely it is part of the goal. But what you, you make such an important point, which is that the, the original description of what happened um, with the murder of George Floyd uh, is too often what people, what, you know, that, that's what has been the, the most likely thing that most people have written or said about these police killings. Um, and and the, only the fact that we had that video, that we were able to see that video that all of Americans, the whole world could see exactly what happened. This really gets at the fundamental challenge we have, which is that how incredibly difficult it is to hold law enforcement ac uh, accountable for police killings, um, of which we, we have uh, roughly a thousand of them a year. And if it is, was not for these videos, where would we be right now? We have to, though, move past where we you know, we were able to get accountability for the murder of George Floyd, George Floyd and move to actual justice for all people, especially black and brown people and all people of color that are much more likely to be the victims of violence and gun violence um, when it comes to law enforcement. In terms of the systemic changes uh, that you mentioned are necessary, you know, many of them are, are included in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. What are some of the things that are included in that bill that you think are non-negotiable, must pass, absolutely necessary uh, to change the future? Because many of, you know, some of the things are, are you know, uh, no-knock warrants, um, which that would be helpful, but they're not, it's not as substantial in terms of the effect as some of the other components. But what's the deal, what are the deal breakers for you? Yeah, well, so for me, certainly banning the most egregious of these police practices like no-knock warrants and, and, and chokeholds is, is absolutely essential. But that isn't going to be the real systemic change that we need. There are, it's extremely important that we get much more transparency into uh, individual police officers that um, habitually use excessive force. And that's why one of the things that I think is very important is that we create a natural, a national registry for uh, um, excessive use of force. And we also are able to track which individual officers um, have been um, found to have used excessive force so that they can't hop from one department to another. But even more important than this is changing the rules and the laws so that we can actually have accountability. Right now, it is virtually impossible to hold police officers accountable for um, ex excessive use mm -hmm. of force. And that has to change. And then we've got to even think beyond that, because what is happening is in this country, we have an epidemic of gun violence, and it is disproportionately um, harming and killing um, black, young black men, black teens. And that culture of violence that that is uh, that is killing people, we have got to get upstream with that by really looking at violence prevention efforts that we know can be successful. And that's the system, the racist system that has to change. So do you make a connection between uh, gun violence in communities um, and police violence? Because I feel like there is a connection. It's not the same issue. Um, and, and there were reports even today earlier of a sh shooting at a middle school. So everybody sort of, you know, held their breath and hoped, um, it, you know, it wasn't going to be another tragedy. Um, but how, how do we make the connection more clear between the violence that is hurting communities in all of these different ways and, and put in place the structural reforms you're talking about um, to improve those situations? Well, I believe that what we have to do is to look at this epidemic of gun violence in this country. Um, we are completely different from any other industrialized country in the world, and we have to see this as a public health challenge. We have to approach it just like we approached uh, addressing um, um,
traffic deaths uh, over 20 years ago. We've seen a dramatic decrease in traffic deaths because we approach this like a public health problem. What can we do to get at the root causes of this violence? There are examples of this really working in cities like Boston, uh, where we have been able to address this root cause. And, and it goes back to these uh, communities that have been the victims of uh, racist systems when it comes to housing and um, and and access to yeah. food and access to education, access to economic opportunity. Those kinds of environments foment um, foment violence that is not, it, it's about the environment, the system that people are trapped in that we have to change if we really want to address uh, this, this epidemic of violence. Senator Tina Smith, thank you so much for being here again, uh, and please stay safe. Let's face it, America's jail and prison system is pretty messed up. One glaring example is what's happening in Atlanta, Georgia. The Fulton County Jail has been overcrowded for years. A report from earlier this year showed the jail was 400 inmates over its capacity. Two rising stars in the Atlanta rap scene decided to do something about it. Over the weekend, Young Thug and Gunna got 30 people out of the Fulton County Jail after posting their bond. Most of them were arrested on minor offenses, but were stuck in jail because they couldn't post the money to get out. Records shared this exclusive video showing the moment dozens of Fulton County inmates were released from the county jail. Watch this emotional reunion between a father and his young son. You never know what somebody been through, bro, and I understood when I just, it was people sitting out three, four years, they couldn't get out of, on a, on a, on a bond. If they did a crime, they could do the time, it's all right. You know, but it's like, you, you giving them a bond higher than what they stole. The video of those inmates getting released is supposed to be used in a music video set to drop soon, so keep an eye out for that. Well, it's great to see Young Thug and Gunna helping out. This whole story shines a light on one of the major flaws in our criminal justice system, a system where low-level offenders get stuck in jails, awaiting trial, sometimes for years, simply because they don't have enough money to pay their bond, because they're poor. A system that needs to be fixed ASAP. Coming up. Getting America's top earners to pay their fair share will break down Biden's plan to tax the rich. Plus, the Republican family feud continues. Former Congressman David Jolly helps me break down the infighting within the grand old party when we're back in 60 seconds. President Biden is nearing his 100th day in office, and so far, the majority of the country approves of the job he's doing. Meanwhile, right now, House Republicans are holding a retreat in Orlando, Florida, just hours away from Donald Trump's base at Mar-a-Lago. The leadership says they're focusing on the future of the party and how to unite on major policy issues. I think right now uh, the Republican Party is headed by Mitch McConnell uh, and uh, Kevin McCarthy in the House. I think our elected leaders, uh, you know, are the ones who are in charge of the Republican Party. And I think as we look at 22 and 24, uh, we are very much going to be focused on substance and on the issues. Uh, and, and I think that's where we've got to attract back the voters that we lost in 2020. But over the weekend, the top House Republicans seemed to backtrack on key points he made himself about Trump's involvement in the January 6th insurrection, signaling there might be more Trump involvement in the party's future. 
When I talked to President Trump about I was the first person to contact him when the riots was going on, he didn't see it. What he ended the call was saying, telling me he'll put something out to make sure to stop this. And that's what he did. He put a video out later. Quite a lot later. And it was a pretty weak video, but I'm asking you specifically, did he say to you, I guess some people are more concerned about the election than you are. No, listen, my conversations with the president are my conversations with the president. Joining me now is former Congressman David Jolly, who we always have to mention is no longer a republic affiliated with the Republican Party. Uh, Congressman, does it seem to you that more Americans, Republicans specifically, are getting on board with President Biden's plans for the country and turning their backs on the last four years? Yeah, there is. I just got to point out, Zerlina, it's interesting. Kevin McCarthy right there wanted to talk about his conversation with the president until Chris Wallace pushed him on it and suggested Kevin was lying. And then he said, oh, I'm not going to talk about my conversation <laughs> with the president. That's a perfect reflection of today's GOP. It's this artificial uh, platform, if you will, that is all Trump centric. And so the question about whether or not voters are going to find themselves supporting Joe Biden in this moment, yes. And the, and the numbers prove that out. Look, a majority of the Americans at the 100 day mark support Joe Biden. He had a very successful legislative effort with the COVID relief bill. We have seen the vaccination rollout exceed expectations. I think the, the one data point in that poll we saw over the weekend, the multiple polls regarding Biden at the 100 day mark was a poll that suggested that at this point in his presidency, Biden is seen as more liberal, more progressive than either Barack Obama or Bill Clinton at the 100 day mark. Is that simply a reflection of where our politics are in 2021? Probably so. But I would expect that Republicans try to get their voters back, not by promoting Republican policies, but by demonizing Joe Biden and scaring voters into thinking that perhaps Joe Biden is the most progressive president we've ever seen, as I believe Lindsey Graham or someone else has tried to describe him. But that's a joke, right? I mean, I think that, like, who are they trying to convince with that? Because if you're talking about, you know, folks who maybe they did vote for Donald Trump, but they voted for Joe Biden uh, because they didn't think injecting bleach was really a viable option or, yeah. you know, natural herd immunity without a vaccine was a good idea. They were like, those are crazy ideas. I'm going to go over here with the person who's saying something different um, just to, to be uh, kind of funny about it. But yeah. it's deadly serious, um, you know. You had you had so many people go do that. But then I, I hear Liz Cheney talk about, you know, we're going to be the party of ideas. And I just I'm so confused right now as to what the Republican Party is doing, because you have leaders talking yeah. about how they're going to be for ideas. And then you have them, you know, still tying themselves directly to Donald Trump. Yeah. And I believe in that press conference, Liz Cheney was actually asked if charges should be pressed against Donald Trump for his role in January 6. And what you saw from Liz Cheney was a pivot to let's talk about policies. But today's Republican Party is yeah. largely devoid of of those policy proposals. We've seen that. Look, on issues from immigration to health care to taxes, whatever it might be, they don't have a very defensible position. Now, fortunately, in the minority, they have the luxury of just opposing what Joe Biden puts forward and Democrats put forward, whether that's irresponsible or not in their opposition, but they do not have proposals. They had their shot. They had their shot of controlling the Congress and controlling the White House, and they did nothing on immigration. They did nothing on health care. They did nothing on the issues that impact Main Street America. It's one of the reasons Joe Biden was able to win last November. So in terms of 2022, though, it feels like, I mean, this majority in both both chambers is incredibly slim um, in the House um, yeah. because of redistricting and because of uh, all, all of the changes related to the census and population growth. Um, it, it's just still going to be very close. Do you think Republicans understand that it's not you? you do they care, I guess is my question, uh, the reason they win back the House, whether it's they had good ideas or whether or not they suppressed enough vote and gerrymandered enough districts uh, to be able to win back that uh, very small majority? No, they don't care on what platform they win it back. Kevin McCarthy in particular will say anything it takes, as we've seen the way he's handled the Trump situation post January 6th. Kevin McCarthy desperately wants to be Speaker of the House, and he will say and do anything to get there. Now, the historical trend is in Republicans' favor, right? The first midterm of a new president is one that typically favors the opposition party. And we know it's a very slim majority for Democrats in the House. 
the census today indicates Republicans will pick up a few seats, likely seats in Republican trending states. Mm -hmm. And so the trend is the Republican friend in this moment. And look, negative partisanship for the past 30 or 40 years has been more powerful, unfortunately, often than putting forward policies and ideas. I expect all we will hear from Republicans from now and through, through the midterms is how progressive Joe Biden and the Democratic Party is. They will scare voters back to their side. At least that will be their strategy. It's up to Democrats. Democrats to sell voters on why their proposals and President Biden's agenda is right for the future of the country. What happened to a debate about ideas and policies? Oh, I thought that's what politics <laughs> is. I got into this because I like to argue. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and now it's like there's, not, the there's no debate Party to be had, and, and I'm just sitting here waiting. <laughs> Fair enough. Touche. David Jolly, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's always great to chat with you about the state of politics these days. Please stay safe. President Biden is planning to follow through on his campaign promise to tax high-income households. Biden wants to increase taxes from 37% back to nearly 40% on those in the top income tax bracket. That tax rate was slashed by former President Trump during his tax overhaul back in 2017. The White House is hoping to use the extra funds to pay for the American Families Plan, a section of the infrastructure plan which focuses on non-traditional aspects of infrastructure, like child care, paid leave, and education. The plan will, will, will be formally released ahead of the president's speech before a joint session of Congress on Wednesday. But lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are already preparing for a fight over increasing taxes. Do you think that raising taxes to help those who need it most? I think is we can doable? find a balance, or but when you have reports from professionals uh, that say that four hundred billion to one trillion dollars not even collected in the loopholes we had, we've eviscerated the IRS. They don't have the guts or basically the, the firepower they had before. All of this thing should be explored before we start just raising taxes exponentially. So you don't support raising taxes at all right now? Oh, yeah. I always support, basically. I'm, 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 I'm supporting anything that makes common sense and is reasonable. But if you're so just saying raising, raising tax taxes for the sake of raising taxes... I'm not going to raise corporate taxes to 28%. At the end of the day, I'm willing to not pay for some of the infrastructure spending because I think it, over time, pays for itself. We're not going to do a couple trillion dollars. 85% of it's got nothing to do with infrastructure. But polling shows the majority of Americans support this large-scope infrastructure plan. And they really like paying for the plan with a tax hike on corporations and the rich. Paying for infrastructure that way gets a 71% thumbs up. 71% of Americans agree on very few things, so that is significant. And joining me now is Lynette Lopez. She's a columnist for Business Insider. Okay, Lynette, it, I kind of wanted to chuckle there when Lindsey Graham was like, I'm not going to go along with a tax hike because I feel like somebody should mention he's not in the majority. So, so it's much more I, important I, what, what Senator Manchin is saying in terms of uh, what he thinks about tax hikes. But if lawmakers are already planning to fight, what's the president's best plan of action here? I don't know what Senator Manchin was saying either. I think Senator Manchin is trying to find <laughs> this middle ground where he can talk to republicans and he can talk to democrats is that because that's kind of his thing um but the reality is most americans think this is a great idea they love the idea of taxing the rich and the uh complaints that i've heard from rich people about this are ridiculous and nonsensical like i had one hedge fund manager try to explain to me that um this taxing uh capital gains for people who made a million dollars will hurt retirees who have $10 million and need to buy a third house. And I was like, oh no, what will they do? Um, so <laughs> it's kind of the same nonsense we've been hearing from the right for decades, but I think Americans are more aware and, and have become very frustrated with these arguments, especially after Trump cut taxes for the wealthy and it really didn't do anything to spur the economy. So. You know, Americans obviously agree on something that's shocking. And I think the Republican Party is having a real problem with this, like, oh, God, Joe Biden is doing things that are popular issue. It's hard. It's hard for them. The 
<laughs> that I mean, that is a good point, though. But I, I especially think in the pandemic, we can't forget that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And I feel like because we're in this um, and everybody can see things they couldn't see before, like there are people in the suburbs, white, white suburban families who are like, I see systemic racism. I never saw that before. But now I see it so clearly um, because of, of just, I think, this pause allowing us to do that. But in terms of that, that point you made about what the Republican argument was for tax decrease, tax cuts, um, none of those promises came true. I remember when the House Republicans uh, stood out in the Rose Garden and did the ceremony um, when they passed that, that bill. But all of the things that they were saying were going to happen, did they, they didn't happen. Right. We didn't see like this massive boom in manufacturing. In fact, 2019 before the pandemic was one of the worst years for manufacturing since the financial crisis. We didn't see this surge in business investment. We didn't see this big mega surge in hiring. None of that happened. So, you know, Americans have this very stark contrast right in front of them to see, which was the Trump tax cut and what they did. And frankly, what has happened during the pandemic, how some people had very, very, very different pandemics based on income levels in this country. I think that really hit home to many Americans that there is a massive, massive inequality gap here. And look, the inexhaustible an inexhaustible resource of this republic is rich people complaining and talking their book. They're on TV doing it all the time. They're on all sorts of networks doing it all the time. I hear it all day. You're going to hear anything from, um, you know, startup CEOs saying that, oh, no, this will kill innovation because people I wanted to hire will instead go make a uh, go work for Google and make three million dollars. That's actually something we saw on CNBC today. You're going to see all kinds of wild claims um, about how rich people will not survive. Uh, this tax increase, I just ignore it. Yeah, I, I don't get the sense that they're they're going to have issues surviving. Literally, I mean, I think to your point, it was it's more about having more when you already have so much, and how some people don't have anything or very little. Um, traditionally, increasing taxes on corporations and rich people polls really well, and that makes me feel like Congress, or at least Republicans in Congress, frankly, and maybe Joe Manchin. Maybe you need to look at a poll. Why are they against something that a vast majority of the people in the country agree is a good thing? Well, this is something I really wonder about a lot when it comes to the Republican Party. How long can a party stand for things that are very unpopular and still kind of get by? And I think that Republicans are kind of trying to straddle this line by attacking corporations on one hand, and also, you know, saying that they're not going to increase their taxes on the other hand, kind of, you know, having this populist bent in one way and, and also still trying to be the party of business. The problem is for corporations, um, this creates a society that is fractious and angry. This, that means angry employees. That means angry customers. That means angry shareholders. So businesses are looking at this and corporations are looking at this and saying, we don't need this populist crap. We don't need this like anger constantly in the United States of America. So it, it, the GOP is kind of losing part of that a uh, corporate base of support. Mm. Well, it's been interesting to see how some individual corporations have come out, um, you know, against what Republicans are doing in terms of voting, su voter suppression. Um, and I think that to your point, um, you know, corporations are paying attention to this and, and making calculations based on the polling data and what public opinion says. Lynette Lopez, thank you so much for being here. Um, that was a very fun conversation about tax cuts, which I didn't even know was possible, but apparently it is with you. <laughs> Please stay safe. Coming up, India facing a COVID crisis. Dr. Ven Gupta joins me to talk about the pandemic surge in Southeast Asia and the global vaccination effort. We're back in 90 seconds.
over the last few days, we've been reminded that COVID-19 is a global pandemic. India, which has the second largest population in the entire world, is in complete crisis. The country has had 350,000 new COVID cases every day over the past five days, which is a global record. Its hospitals are overwhelmed. It is short on oxygen. And with 2,000 people now dying of COVID every single day, some of its crematoriums are having to increase capacity. India is the world's leading manufacturer of COVID vaccines, but only about 10% of its population has received at least one dose of the vaccine compared to over 42% in the United States. The White House said today that the U.S. will begin sharing all of its AstraZeneca vaccine doses with the world, which could be as many as 60 million doses in the coming months. The FDA first has to approve AstraZeneca for emergency use. And in other pandemic news, turns out vaccines really matter. More than a year after Europe banned most non-essential travel, the European Commission has announced that fully vaccinated tourists from the U.S. will likely be allowed to visit this summer. Just imagine if you get your shots, you go to Paris. Sounds like a good plan. Joining me now is Dr. Vin Gupta. He's a critical care pulmonologist and an NBC News medical contributor. Okay, Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for being here as always. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. So what is your response to the announcement that the U.S. will share all of its AstraZeneca vaccine doses? Um, Because I think most people only know of that vaccine because of some of the difficulty um, they had in Europe. So in terms of the the messaging that also needs to go along with this, um, you know, what do you think the U.S. needs to do to make sure they have this approval, they're able to share the doses, but also send the message that we're not just sort of sending this vaccine that's less effective than the others. Uh, you know, so Lena, you bring up a number of points there. I guess what I would say is, uh, you know, putting on my pulmonologist hat, uh, and uh, I happen to be in, in the Air Force Reserves as a critical care doc, and there's a capability that exists. It's called the Critical Care Air Transport Team, part of the U.S. Air Force's rapid response sort of strike team, uh, if you will. And this is a series of mobile ICU teams that are across the country. Most of them are not deployed right now. And this is the exact reason why millions of dollars in taxpayer money are spent every year to sustain this capability to support either in-country efforts or uh, uh, crises abroad. I I wish they would deploy some members of our team, our team here in Seattle is ready to go, to support this effort in India because they need ICU capability, especially in places like Mumbai, Hmm. other big cities in Delhi. They need trained staff. They need the ability for triage uh, ICU beds outside hospital facilities like you saw in Central Park. They need that same paradigm. So we Mm -hmm. can do more uh, to to save lives right now. Sending raw materials for vaccines isn't going to do anything in the the near term. Private sector is doing a lot in terms of sending oxygen canisters to to major cities in India, that could be also an area of focus where you use C5 cargo jets, you name it, to get that capability, to get those supplies to India. We could easily marshal enough resources through our military to just move around product like oxygen. So that's something I hope we can see. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, this is more experimental, but you know, Zerlina, Regeneron is developing subcutaneous monoclonal antibodies. So meaning you just inject it like insulin instead of getting it through an IV infusion. And that could be helpful as well. I mean, I think we have to think outside the box. How can we save people's lives? We're thinking maybe it's recorded that 2,000 people are dying, but some estimates say five to 10 times that number are dying every single day just because of data mismanagement. I mean, it is enormous, the scale of the tragedy happening, which is why I think we need to think outside the box, but do more, more than just send raw materials, PPE and tests, which is how I read the initial message yesterday from uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan. So that's such an important reframe of the question because I think, you know, when you hear the, the Biden administration say, okay, we're gonna send them some vaccines, you're, you're basically saying the, the vaccine, that's good, they need that, but actually in the short term, they need uh, treatment and supplies to treat people who are catching and have COVID, right? That's exactly right, Zerlina. I think we're right now we're missing an opportunity to save lives right now. And, and uh, of course, 
that requires the Indian government to say, can you please help us? So I'm not, I, I don't mean to place blame on at, at the foot of the Biden administration for not doing things that I think they should be doing. They might have offered it. This requires the Modi government to say, will you yeah. help us and send forces? This is bilateral here. But I do think that there's more we can do right now to stem the loss of life. And I didn't see those initiatives actually become enumerated in the letter between the the, the national security advisor and, and, and his Indian counterpart. There was a lot of uh, things on the, on the margins, don't get me wrong, test PPE, raw materials for vaccines that will help in four to six weeks, but not right now. So, th so that's the key piece there. I will also uh, just add to so Lena, this is gonna be past his prologue here. This is gonna be the situation, not just in India, but in Brazil, in other parts uh, of uh, say Sub-Saharan Africa. This is just setting up what's gonna end up being the haves and the have nots for the rest of 2021 into 2022. There's not enough vaccine supply to immunize India, much less most of South Asia, most of Sub-Saharan Africa. We are just, we're running into a supply of vaccine problem for most of the Southern hemisphere. So yeah. you're gonna see something replayed across other geographies. I mean, hopefully not to this extent of loss of life, but this is, this is gonna be the paradigm for a lot of other geos across the country while we begin to normalize. So there is gonna be a new normal here while the rest of the world's suffering and we're not. That is really concerning. Um, and hopefully we'll have you back soon to have a longer conversation just about w why it's so important to, not just because we care about other humans, but because uh, it's a global pandemic that knows no borders. So it's important for us to be concerned and care about um, the situations in other places besides the United States uh, in the long term. Dr. Vin Gupta, thank you so much for being here as always um, and, and helping us understand everything going on with COVID right now. Please stay safe. Coming up, the winners, the losers, the shockers, and the snubs, Oscar night was full of drama. That and the social justice messages on display in Hollywood last night. We'll get into all of that when we return in 60 seconds. to hate someone because they are Mexican or because they are black or white or LBGTQ. I refuse to hate someone because they are a police officer. I refuse to hate someone because they are Asian. I would hope that we would refuse hate. And I want to take this Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award and dedicate it to anyone who wants to stand in the middle, no matter what's around the wall, stand in the middle, because that's where healing happens. That's where conversation happens. That's where change happens. It happens in the middle. So anyone who wants to meet me in the middle to refuse hate, to refuse blanket judgment, and to help lift someone's feet off the ground, this one is for you too. Winners at last night's Academy Awards used their platforms to voice strong messages about all of the violence and anger we've seen over the past several months. Co-director and now Oscar winner Trevon Free wore a jacket lined with the names of unarmed black men killed by police. And during his speech, he begged Americans to be compassionate and respond to the threat of police violence. On average, the police in America every day kill three people which amounts to about a thousand people a year. And those people happen to disproportionately be black people. And, you know, James Baldwin once said, the most despicable thing a person can be is indifferent to other people's pain. And so I just ask that you please not be indifferent. Please don't be indifferent to our pain. 
history was also made last night. The director of Nomadland, Chloe Zhou, became the first woman of color and only the second woman ever to win Best Director. The woman who won Best Supporting Actress for Minari is the first Korean actor to ever win an Oscar. And Mia Neal and Jamika Wilson became the first black women to win a hair and makeup award for their work on Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Joining me to discuss is John Murray. He's a TV host and pop culture expert. Okay, all about the Oscars, like my favorite segment every year. Um, so what did you think about the show itself last night? Obviously, it was a little bit different because of COVID. Um, but it seemed like they were still able to, you know, have a, a number of people in the room. There was still fashion. It was still exciting. What, what are your take, top takeaways? Well, Zelina, it's my first time here, so let me first say thank you for having me, and I enjoyed the smart conversation that you have on this dialogue, I mean, on this platform. It's always great dialogue, and I love watching. Uh, but last night was the culmination of the Hollywood award show season. It is Hollywood's biggest night, and even though it was supposed to be their concentrated award show, it was supposed to pack a punch. Now, I was very excited watching the opening of the show with Regina King. Now, if they needed to do a reinterpretation of the Jill Scott uh, song, Let's Take a Long Walk, she lived that at the Oscars last night. So I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be innovative. It's gonna be creative. But it was kind of downhill from there. The show became dull, it became mm. melancholy. I mean, I was really hoping at some point a commercial was gonna pop up and Red Bull was the sponsor because this is probably one of the sleepiest Oscars I'd ever seen. All the performances were in the pre-show. There were no video montages. They didn't use video clips. They didn't even do any of the special movie, you know, spoofs and parodies that they do. It was these elongated yeah. speech. And I thought some of the winners thought they were in therapy sessions last night. I don't know that the Oscars can survive <laughs> format. They've got to get a host back desperately. That's such a funny point. I mean, I just think about Daniel Kaluuya being like, my mom and dad had sex and I'm here now. And I'm like, You're, you really shouldn't say that in your acceptance speech for your Oscar. But having interviewed Daniel uh, one time, I totally can see how that could happen because he is the, one of the more unfiltered people I've ever met. Um, so, so relatedly, he, he, he played a really important historical figure. And, you know, he was speaking to the press uh, when a reporter um, when a reporter uh, asked him, uh, confused him with Leslie Odom Jr., um, who was nominated for another movie directed by Regina King, uh, One Night in Miami. I mean, in terms of sort of the entertainment of the night, was Daniel Kaluuya basically it? <laughs> Is that all we got? Well, let me first say, Lena, you know, I too, at, at, in certain environments, have been mistaken for either Ice Cube or Lenny Kravitz. It just depends on who the person is during the mistaking. So, when, yes, we're all black, but we don't all look alike. Um, but uh, there were several decent moments in the show. My favorite, of course, was Glenn Close. Glenn Close, knowing mm, us, me too. Uh, <laughs> the butt from Spike Lee school days, uh, and shouting out the backyard band, and then getting up and doing the butt, I tweeted mm -hmm. that she is invited to the cookout, and not only does she get the chicken and mambo sauce, because mambo sauce is a condiment that we love here in the D.C., DMV, Maryland, Virginia area, but she also would get my aunt's good potato salad. Not the potato salad she gives to the random strays, but she gets the good potato salad. Glenn Close, for me, was one of the highlights of the night. She stole the show. Yeah, the, the good dish, the special dish that's in back and the other refrigerator that no one knows about. I mean, no one knows about the secret, like this, you know, the secret macaroni and cheese, the secret potato salad at the cookout. Um, so some people liked the intimate setting of this year's Oscars. I thought it was different. Obviously, it needed to be because of COVID. Um, but do you think that some of the changes, we'll see them next year? I mean, you mentioned that it was a little lackluster in terms of uh, the energy from the top top to the end. Um, but do you think like some of the things worked and will be used again in the future? Well, listen, uh, I thought the venue was terrible. The idea of it on paper probably seemed good. <laughs> Um, but this was the most diverse show that we've seen in Oscars history. I mean, it was so diverse and inclusive. They, the UN may have been a better setting for this award show. Maybe the lighting would have been better there. <laughs> Um, the other thing was that this show desperately needs a host. You need someone who can drive the energy. Um, and so I'm leading the campaign. I started last night, Zelina. I want Eddie Murphy to host the 2022 Oscars. He was supposed to host the show before, but when the director somehow got fired, he pulled out of the show. He's never done it. Eddie Murphy's never had an Oscar win, but he needs to host the Oscar show. 
I think that would be an incredible thing. I'm just worried. I, I just, I don't, I feel like they, they're, how are they going to produce that? <laughs> because basically, like, he, he's just going to say anything. He's not going to listen to what, he's not going to read what they have in front of him. He's if, going to say if, whatever he wants. He's Eddie Murphy, if, right? If, Oscars, if Chris Rock can make it through the Oscars, Eddie Murphy will be a piece of cake. He's going <laughs> to give them the Oscars. There's so many other people who could be doing this, but he deserves a chance. He's Hollywood royalty, and it's time that he be treated as such. Okay, last question, one minute left. Uh, who is their best dressed? Oh, best dressed. So, you know, I I miss Joan Rivers so much. I used to love the red carpet that she hosted it, and when she hosted it, and she used to always hate when men wore color, but men don't have to, have to, always have to be in black, even though I'm in black with you tonight. So I love Leslie Odom. I love what Daniel <laughs> Kalua had. I love men taking choices and being creative with their fashion. I love that too. I, I did really very much like Leslie Odom's ensemble. And and the straight shoulders on Regina King, that was remarkable. She looks good. Regina King does no wrong. Not ever. Not one time ever have I seen her wear anything where I'm like, I don't know why you're wearing that. She always looks like a goddess. And she is. She's wonderful and lovely. Um, John Murray, thank you so much for a fun conversation about uh, the 93rd. Uh, annual Academy Awards. Thank you so much for being here. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina Maxwell and the Medi Hassan Show is coming up next. Coronavirus is still devastating the world in no place more than India. What the US is finally doing to help, but will it be enough as cases continue to skyrocket there? Plus, is it stop the steal or steal the next election? The new way that swing state Republicans are trying to put their collective thumb on the scale before 2024. Also, drop that burger. Joe Biden is totally not, and completely, except he isn't, coming for your red meat. Ahead, how the right's new imaginary war on meat was born. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. If there was ever a moment to show us just how much this pandemic is a global pandemic, one that depends on the world working together to end the coronavirus, it might be now. 
Here in the US, we're seeing some, some vaccination sites around the country close down due to decreasing demand. More than half of adults in the United States have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose. And thankfully, most of the country isn't seeing a rise in cases. The COVID-19 pandemic seems to be under control here, finally. But that's not our COVID story this evening. Halfway around the world, India is in the throes of an absolutely horrifying situation that's become a kind of reckoning for the rest of the world. For the last five days, the second most populated country in the world has broken global records for daily COVID infection rates. In what some have described as an apocalyptic nightmare, people are scavenging for oxygen tanks, doctors are helping patients in the streets as hospitals have become completely overrun. Countless families are watching their loved ones die outside healthcare facilities. On just Sunday alone, more than 350,000 cases and nearly 3,000 deaths were confirmed. But statisticians say the real numbers could be two, five, even 10 times that. Meaning India could have just had more than 3 million new cases and 30,000 deaths in a single day. As crematoriums become overwhelmed with the iron in some of the grills melting from sheer overuse, families are being allowed to bury their loved ones in their backyards. Sky News reporter Alex Crawford was on the scene of a community burial site in East Delhi. This is a makeshift crematorium. It's actually not meant to exist. This has been set up by the residents around here who cannot cope with the number of dead. Social media has been flooded by Indian doctors, family members, reporters, pleading for insistence. I have money, I have everything, but I can't save my sister. Because no bed, nothing, nothing like that. No beds. To give you a sense of how many people have it, reports say Kolkata, a city of nearly 15 million people, is seeing a 50% positivity rate, meaning every other person tested in a city nearly twice the size of New York has been infected. Last night I spoke with Indian journalist Bharat Dutt, who's been on the ground reporting on this crisis. Her own father is currently on a ventilator. This is how she described how dire the situation is. It is a calamity and a crisis of the kind that I have not seen in my adult life. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is, in fact, the only story in my life that has left me wanting and struggling for words. So how has the world responded to what is fast becoming one of the biggest humanitarian crises on Earth? Over the last week, countries around the world, including the UK, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, began sending medical equipment to India, from oxygen tanks to ventilators. Even India's geopolitical rivals, China and Pakistan, offered their assistance. And as for the US, earlier today, President Biden spoke with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, saying the US will provide a range of emergency assistance, including oxygen-related supplies, vaccine materials, and therapeutics. The help is no doubt much appreciated, and it comes at a critical time. But what many are rightly pointing out is, has it come too late? And is it enough? India's current spike has been sharply rising since the beginning of the month. And it was on April the 16th that the CEO of the Serum Institute of India, the world's biggest vaccine maker, begged Biden to send raw materials to make more vaccines. Today, 10 days later, the US announced it will share 60 million doses of the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine with foreign countries. See, pressuring the Biden administration does work, though it hasn't explicitly mentioned India or Brazil, the country with right behind India with the most number of con confirmed COVID cases in the world. Experts now say Brazil is like a brewery, brewing variants left, right and center. The common theme in the US, India and Brazil, by the way, the top three countries for COVID cases and deaths in the last week is that they were led through this pandemic by leaders who repeatedly displayed a blatant disregard for the deadly nature of this virus. This recklessness from right-wing Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his governing party, the BJP, was just like what we saw here in the US. They not only downplayed the pandemic, they held huge political rallies and allowed massive religious festivals in spite of the pandemic, in spite of the spread of COVID, events that became super spreaders. Modi declared victory even prior to the vaccine rollout and the BJP put out a statement in February 
saying the party unequivocally hails its leadership for introducing India to the world as a proud and victorious nation in the fight against COVID. That aged well. If this wasn't such a serious matter, if this wasn't so personal to me as someone who has family in India fighting against this disease right now, perhaps I'd laugh at the irony of such a ridiculous thing to have said. But I can't. The situation is only getting worse. Scientists are now investigating a double mutant COVID variant in India. It sounds like a villain out of a comic book series. But they're saying this real threat has the potential to drive other infections around the world. And that's why what's happening thousands of miles away matters to us and the rest of the world so much. Here's U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy explaining. If there is uncontrolled spread of the virus in other parts of the world, that means that there's a greater chance that new mutations and variants will develop that may escape the protection of the vaccines that we have in the United States. Our fate ultimately as the world is, is, into, you know, is really integrally linked. We learned this from Ebola, Jonathan. We learned right. that we can't just seek to protect ourselves, but our destiny is dependent on the fate of other countries as well. So I'm biased. I said this on the show last night that I have two cousins in India right now with COVID in hospital. Others sick at home. A friend just lost her brother there. So did an aunt. Every Indian American I know is sharing stories right now on WhatsApp, on Facebook, about loved ones in India who are sick, can't get oxygen, can't find a hospital bed. But this story matters to all of us. Listen to the Surgeon General. There's a moral reason for helping the Indias and Brazils of this world, but there's also self-interest. We cannot defeat the coronavirus in isolation. As long as it continues to spread, infect, kill, and mutate, whether here in the United States or in India, we'll never be free of it. Joining me now to discuss this is Congressman Ro Khanna, Democrat of California and Vice Chair of the India Caucus in the House, and Dr. Ashish Jha, Dean of the Brown University School of Public Health, who wrote a much-discussed op-ed for the Washington Post over the weekend, arguing that it is time for the United States, the world's oldest democracy, to come to the aid of this key global ally. Uh, thank you both for joining me. Dr. Jha, let me start with you. You have been following the COVID crisis in America from the start. You're one of the country's experts on this. You've been following the pandemic globally as well. Put it in context for us. How bad is the situation in India right now with COVID-19? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I would say it's pretty off. Uh, we are right now in the worst days of the global pandemic uh, in terms of number of infections happening globally. And India is at the heart of it. India is the epicenter. Uh, the 350,000 number that we're quoting is surely an underestimate by a lot. And so it's really quite a yes. challenge, a situation we're in. It's a huge challenge. And Congressman, you've been very vocally drawing attention to the situation in India over the past week uh, and demanding the Biden administration do something. Does yesterday's promise of PPE equipment and oxygen and today's announcement about sharing 60 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine with the rest of the world, does that cut it? Is that enough for you? Well, Matthew, first, let me say that my thoughts are with your family there. And you're absolutely right. There are many Indian Americans who have family there, who have loved ones there. Uh, who are in hospitals, some who don't have oxygen. So the situation is dire, not just from a statistic perspective, but also from an anecdotal perspective. And I just want to take a second to thank Dr. Ja. His advocacy, that op-ed, directly influenced the Biden administration's actions. I know this for talking to people in the administration and in Congress. Uh, and he really had a massive impact. And I really appreciate his leadership. I do applaud the president for the step he's taken uh, getting oxygen uh, to India, making sure that we're going to have AstraZeneca. I think it will get to India after they make sure that it's safe. Uh, and I appreciate things that Binod Khosla and other entrepreneurs are doing who've opened up Twitter direct messages saying, if you're a hospital and need help, uh, direct message us and we'll get resources. But I think there's a structural problem. And that is that as the United States moves to full vaccination, over 100 countries around this world don't have access to the vaccine. We paid $2 billion for Pfizer to get those vaccines, to pre-order them. We gave Moderna the IP from the NIH. The least they can do is license their vaccine recipe to the rest of the world so the rest of the world can manufacture that vaccine. That's a moral obligation 
And I believe the president should call the Pfizer CEO, call the Moderna CEO, and demand that. And if not, we will immediately remove the TRIPS waiver at the WHO. Uh, so on that note, you just reminded me that I, I was planning to talk about this. You brought it up. Let me ask you, will President Biden at the WTO next month, you talked about the TRIPS waiver, this intellectual uh, property agreement around the vaccines. India, ironically, along with South Africa, Congressman, came to the WTO six months ago saying, get rid of it. Let us make the vaccine en masse, generic versions of it. Will the Biden administration lead the way in the Western world and vote to get rid of that and allow that to happen? They must. I mean, the argument is so simple. It, Pfizer will still get paid. Moderna will still get paid. What's happening right now is the rest of the world doesn't have the ability to manufacture the vaccine. All they're saying is, let us manufacture it. We're willing to pay you a licensing fee. We need to do two things. We need to allow the rest of the world to manufacture, and we need to have a global fund to assist with that manufacturing. There are 12 billion people who need uh, vaccines, and we're a fraction of the way there. We won't get there if we don't have the mRNA, mRNA vaccines uh, licensed and capable uh, of being manufactured other than by Pfizer or other than by a few select contractor manufacturers. Well... I'm glad you are making that point and speaking out vocally. The pressure needs to be applied. Uh, Dr. Jha, let me ask you this from a health perspective. Are vaccines, as important as they are, going to help India right now, given the rate of infections, given how overrun hospitals are at the moment? What is the best way to help the Indian people tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday? How quickly can we help them? Yeah, so unfortunately, we have two sets of issues. We have about four to six weeks of, I think, infections almost baked in. So we've got to do what we can to help those people get through it. And that's the oxygen, the therapy, the hospital field beds, uh, the shoring up doctors and nurses. That stuff is critical. What we want to do is make sure that this surge comes to an end as quickly as possible. For that, you need public health measures, more testing, more masks and more vaccination. So I do think vaccinations are gonna be very helpful once we get beyond the next few weeks. We've gotta bring this incredibly horrible surge in India under control and vaccines are one part of that. But you're absolutely right, in the, in the next days, it's all about treating the people who are already infected. And that of course requires a Herculean effort and to focus on the healthcare system. And, and Dr. Jha, we're hearing a lot about the double mutant variant and about the various mutations and variants in India. How worried should we all be about them? Are they the kind of thing that could make our own Pfizer and Moderna vaccines eventually ineffective? Or is it that if we let the virus run rampant in a country of a billion people, at some point, inevitably, there will be a variant that our current vaccines can't stop? Yeah, so the, the double mutant, the much, you know, kind of talked about double mutant, I, we don't know as much about it as we would like. We don't have a good sense of how widespread it is because that genomic testing is not yet being done. That needs to be done. Uh, I don't think that that mutant itself is going to render our vaccines ineffective, but you're bringing up a really important point. Large outbreaks are really the fuel for more mutations. They're the fuel for more variants. And large outbreaks will eventually get us to variants that may very well push our vaccines vaccines efficacy way down. I don't want to necessarily uh, push our luck. Obviously, it's got a huge human toll, but it leaves all of us vulnerable. This is one of the many reasons we have to help countries like India and others bring those infection numbers way down. Yeah. We do have to help them, but that requires public support. And thankfully, tragically, this story has now cut through in the American media, in the Western media, in as we saw with the White House today. Congressman, let me ask you this, though. Three of us having this conversation, correct me if I'm wrong, we're all of Indian origin. We all have friends or family in India. We're Indian Americans. How do we get ordinary, average Americans who don't have any ties to India to take this situation, this crisis in India seriously and push the government to do more? Well, first, I think we should be encouraged about a, a multiracial democracy. I mean, in some sense, the diaspora has had an impact, and I do believe it will make American foreign policy more empathetic. It has in this case, and it will not just with India, but nations around the world as more people have ties and understanding and exposure uh, to other parts of the world. But I think there are two things that will uh, get Americans to care. Uh, first is what Dr. Jai and you have said, that this is in our self-interest. You can't have the widespread uh, rampant 
disease outbreaks in other parts of the world and think that we are going to be immune. Even if they don't defeat our vaccines, uh, they certainly will spread to parts of the population that aren't vaccinated. And so it's in our interest to mitigate that. And second, our, our conception as Americans, I believe that we do think of ourselves as a nation that wants to do good in the yeah. world. It's our founding principle. And I, I think we have to appeal to that and, and people That's will respond. Point. We can only hope. Uh, Dr. Ja, I need to ask you, how much of this situation in India is the fault of the government, the Modi government? It's arrogance, it's incompetence. It's been very Trumpian, hasn't it, in terms of super spreader rallies, the lack of masks, etc. Yeah, look, I think most of us saw the infection numbers starting to rise about two months ago. And about a month ago, we were all raising the alarms that we were heading towards a catastrophe. The government really had this attitude of somehow India has beaten COVID when nobody else has. Uh, it is in many ways uh, reminiscent of our former president. Uh, again, he held large rallies with people packed together, no mask in sight. Uh, those are just incredibly unwise things to be doing in the middle of a global pandemic. And unfortunately, the cost is being borne by the Indian people. Yes, it has. Tragedy it has, and it continues to be. Uh, Dr. Ashish Jha, thanks so much for joining us on the show tonight. Appreciate your analysis tonight and that very important op-ed you wrote. Thank you so much. Uh, Congressman, stick around for a moment. Uh, I want to ask you about a little bit more about Indian politics and the Modi government, because you've been a critic of the Modi government. Um, this is a government which not only mishandled the pandemic, but is in recent days asked Twitter, and I know you're, you're the congressman for Silicon Valley, asked Twitter to take down tweets criticizing its handling of the pandemic. That's how authoritarian this government is. What do you make of our, you know, not just our alliance with this government, but the idea that as much as America or the world or the WHO or the WTO can do, fundamentally, it's also a government problem, just as it was here over the last year. Well, first, let me speak perhaps from a spiritual or a religious perspective as uh, someone of Hindu faith. Uh, one thing the virus has treated us, taught us, is humility. This idea that uh, any person or any nation would think that we've conquered a disease, I think, runs contrary to what most religious teaching is about, which says have some humility yes. in the face of, of, of these tasks. And so I think uh, part of the response has been uh, not sufficient humility. The second thing, I mean, the idea that you would censor or tell Mark Zuckerberg or Dorsey to take down tweets, I mean, I, I'd be at it all day. I, I think there are more tweets criticizing me than, than not. And I, I, I think that that's what makes our democracy so rich. It's a, a lot of times, uh, it makes me rethink something or th rethink how I phrase something. Again, it gets to this point of humility. It, it, it is uh, the, the essence, again, of Hinduism, as I understand it, is pluralism, is understanding different perspectives. Amartya Sen wrote a brilliant book, The Argumentative Indian. So it yes. is contrary so to that very spirit mm -hmm. to try to sp squelch this debate. Problem is most nationalist right-wing governments aren't known for their humility. Uh, there are a lot of authoritarian governments, allies, that the US just gives a pass to, whether it's Israel, where mobs have been chanting uh, death to Arabs in recent days, Saudi Arabia, where MBS got off scot-free for killing Jamal Khashoggi, or India, where Modi has been dismantling democracy in many ways. How do you get Joe Biden and American foreign policy to change on that? Well, I think right now the immediate need is how do we help India uh, make sure that they can deal with COVID. But I think more long term, we need to make sure that all our values are always at the forefront. So to speak about uh, making sure that the internet isn't shut down, to speak and make sure that there is not censorship, to speak about religious pluralism and religious tolerance and how that is uh, American ideals and also, in my view, uh, India's ideals and make that front and center of any uh, conversation. I, I do believe having uh, talked to Jake Sullivan yeah. and in the past Secretary Blinken that they will, they will make those issues uh, front and center. But right now, obviously, you know, politics has nothing to do with, with getting oxygen and getting uh, medical supplies to yeah. whoever we can no, no, uh, in India. 
Agreed, but I was just talking big picture. As you said, the long-term dealing with authoritarian allies is always a problem. It's easy to go after the Irans and North Koreas of this world. Uh, just to clarify, Congressman, the last time you and I discussed Israel and Netanyahu, I want to clarify, you were criticised for suggesting <laughs> Israel's burning villages or homes in the occupied West Bank. That was a slip, wasn't it? You weren't referring to the government. I, I, I misspoke, and I acknowledge that. Uh, the, uh, I, uh, Israel yeah. has uh, uh, engaged in demolitions, which I criticised in a letter with... An issue, but I was wrong uh, to suggest that uh, Israel had in any way uh, burned uh, burned villages and, and and has not. And so I uh, even want though, to correct that for yeah, the record. Even though, even though, yeah, and even though, unfortunately, Israeli settlers have burned down orchards, and you have been, uh, thankfully, an outspoken voice on human rights across the Middle East. One last quick question for you. California now has enough signatures to force a recall election of Governor Gavin Newsom. Will he be recalled and defeated, in your view? No, he won't. In fact, I was speaking to him this, this morning. Uh, he also is helping, California is helping India, and we were talking about that. But I, I think this has energized people uh, around uh, Gavin Newsom. Uh, it's uh, had Democrats put aside their differences. Uh, the polling I've seen uh, suggests he's, he's very popular. Uh, the party is unified around him. Uh, and it's going to be un unsuccessful, and it's a, it's a shame that we're going to spend so much time on something that really doesn't have organic support. Congressman Ro Khanna, we'll have to leave it there. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. Appreciate it. Still to come, the modern day burger wars. But first, the state of the GOP lies in its McLeadership. That is McCarthy and McConnell. They're the ones in charge, according to Congresswoman Liz Cheney. I think right now uh, the Republican Party is headed by Mitch McConnell uh, and uh, Kevin McCarthy in the House. I think our elected leaders, uh, you know, are the ones who are in charge of the Republican Party. Right. If that's true, why are people loyal to the former president still trying to undermine November's election in places like Arizona? I'll talk to Secretary of State Katie Hobbs about all of that in 60 seconds. Don't go away. This Friday will mark 100 days since Joe Biden took office. 100 days since the big lie, the lie that Donald Trump actually won, met the US Constitution and lost the lie did. That means it's been 100 days since House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy looked at the consequences of his party's pro-Trump lies and decided to put an end to all that. Just kidding. In interviews with the New York Times published this weekend, McCarthy made clear he was still riding the Trump train in hopes of becoming House Speaker next year. But he also wants us to pretend as if he and his colleagues didn't try and overturn that election, didn't help incite an insurrection. On Fox News Sunday, Chris Wallace pressed McCarthy about reports that on January the 6th, when McCarthy called Trump from inside a besieged capital, asking the president to call off his violent supporters, Trump reportedly replied, well, Kevin, I guess these people are more upset about the election than you are. Here's what McCarthy said to that. I talked to President Trump about, I was the first person to contact him when the riots was going on, he didn't see it. What he ended the call was saying, telling me, he'll put something out to make sure to stop this. And that's what he did, he put a video out later. Quite a lot later, and it was a pretty weak video, but I'm asking you specifically, did he say to you, no, I guess not, some people are more concerned about the election than you are. No, listen, my conversations with the president are my conversations with the president. So just to be clear, 
his conversations with the former president are private when they're bad for him, but public when they might be good for him. Gotcha. But look, this GOP is still kissing the Trump ring and indulging Trump's 2020 election obsession. If you need further proof, then just look at Arizona, where half a year after the presidential election, Republican lawmakers are auditing voting machines I use auditing in the loosest of senses, and recounting two-thirds of all the votes cast in that race. The idea had been floated last December as a way of placating pro-Trump conspiracy theorists, a way of shutting them up, of showing them beyond doubt that Biden carried Arizona, the first Democratic candidate since 1996, to do so, fair and square. But instead, the Arizona audit has become a cesspool of GOP grievance and corruption. Last week, Republicans in the state Senate subpoenaed all 2.1 million votes from heavily Democratic Maricopa County and trucked them into an arena where the Phoenix Suns basketball team used to play. Uh, and the ballots there are now being hand counted by private companies hired by the GOP state senators. The effort is being led by a Florida based company called Cyber Ninjas. And no, I didn't make up that name whose owner tweeted last year from a now defunct social media account that he wholeheartedly supports Trump. Of course he does. He also wrote a talking points memo for Republican senators who planned to challenge the 2020 election at the Capitol on January 6th. A brief filled with lies. A brief that was published online by now disgraced former Trump lawyer Sidney released the Kraken Powell. But wait, it gets better. Cyber Ninjas is asking a judge to keep its procedures for the recount secret and to shut out the public and the press. Oh, the irony. But don't worry about the lack of transparency. Republicans have already lined up a broadcaster to live stream the recount. The state GOP announced last week that the live stream will be given to, wait for it, One American News, OAN, the ultra right wing network that has also peddled Trump's big lie. And OANN host is also raising funds on Twitter for the Arizona recount. Make no mistake about what this is. The people who once cried stop the steal are now trying to steal every Arizona ballot that isn't nailed down. A hundred days after the inauguration of the president. Needless to say, Donald Trump is overjoyed. The ex-president put out a statement last Friday, you may have missed it, thanking the brave and patriotic Republican state senators from Arizona. He added, quote, our country needs the truth of the scam 2020 election to be exposed. I predict the results will be startling. Here's something else startling to consider. Trump lost to Biden by more than 7 million votes, but by much less in battlegrounds like Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, states where top election officials rebuffed Trump's attempts to find more votes after the election. If Trump had succeeded in twisting the results in just a few of those key states, as state Republicans are trying to do now in Arizona, he'd still be president. So what... What does what's happening in Arizona mean for the future of democracy in America? Moments ago, I spoke with one of those election officials who resisted the Republicans' vote-changing efforts, Arizona's Democratic Secretary of State, Katie Hobbs. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Republican lawmakers auditing votes in the most populous, most democratic county in the state with no public access and with the help of a contractor owned by an election conspiracy theorist. How in the world did we get here? Well, you know, this is the Republicans in the legislature trying to pander to their base who refuses to accept the election results from six months ago. Um, You know, and and I've been avoiding calling it an audit because it really isn't that. Um, In most audits and and across any industry, you would have procedures that were clearly laid out. And this firm that's been hired has no auditing experience, no election experience, and they're clearly just making this up as they go along. Yes. Um, And at the same time as this audit, of course, Arizona Republicans have proposed 22 new restrictions on voting in your state, according to the Brennan Center for Justice. They're especially targeting mail-in voting, and they're trying to make it easier to purge people from an early voting list that the GOP legislature created, I believe. Yeah, yeah. None of these bills that you mentioned will actually do anything to improve election um, administration or improve access for voters. Um, And this is really unfortunate coming on the heels of election where we should really be celebrating um, the success that we had in terms of security and the historic participation, not just here in Arizona, but across the country. 
Yeah, and the New York Times is pointing out that in the 2020 election, aside from the presidential race, at the state level, Arizona's two most moderate Republicans in the state Senate both lost re-election. One of them was replaced by a member of the Oath Keepers militia, and another Republican state rep who's an Oath Keeper introduced a bill that would have given legislators the power to overturn a presidential election result if they didn't like it. How much of this is being driven by the fact that your state really has no sane moderate Republicans left in the legislature. <laughs> well, I think that's certainly a big part of it. While there are not necessarily any, any moderates left in the legislature, Republicans have the closest, narrowest margin that they've had in decades in both chambers. And what we're seeing is um, just the most extreme legislation, not just election related, but across the board. Um, so this is really seems to be sort of a last ditch power grab by them um, in a state that is becoming more and more moderate. Yeah, and uh, you talk about power grabs. The same thing that Republicans falsely complained about, we're being cut out of the count, it's all being done in secret, is actually what they're doing right now. Because after the press was barred from the auditing floor, one Arizona Republic reporter uh, got in by volunteering to help with the recount. She says when she was there, ballot counters were using blue pens, which are supposed to be forbidden because they can be read by voting machines and used to change votes. And when she brought it up to die Logan, the right-wing owner of Cyber Ninja, he first said it was fine, then said he wasn't sure, and he said this to reporters. Have a listen. Has your company received outside donations to help supplement the contract? Yes, sir. How much? I don't even know. From whom? I don't even know. How this is the company hired by Republicans to run the quote-unquote vote audit, and they don't know election law. They don't know who's bankrolling them. How legit is any of this? Well, it's not legitimate at all. I mean, this is really what we're seeing as hypocrisy at its finest. Um, They're making this up as they go along, uh, which is not how we should do anything election related in our state. Um, and really, there, there should be no validity given to anything that comes out of this so-called audit. Yeah, and you talk about validity. One of the ways you prevent this from happening, the Democrats can prevent this from happening, uh, is passing HR1, the For the People Act. Um, and that would prevent, not, maybe not all, but a lot of these voter suppression bills in places like Arizona. It's passed in the House. It's now waiting to be put to the floor in a 50-50 Senate. One reason it may not get through, it's stalled right now, is Kirsten Sinema, the Democratic senator from your state, Arizona, who says she's for HR1 but is still blindly defending the filibuster, which is the main obstacle to its passage. What is your message to Kirsten Sinema? What have you said to her? Have you asked her why she won't get behind HR1, even if it means getting rid of the filibuster? Well, we've talked with Senator Sinema's office about HR1, about um, the, the the benefits to Arizona voters of passing a law like HR1. Um, and so, you know, I, I um, am glad that she's supporting it and we'll continue to have conversations with her about what we can do to move this bill forward. But in terms of Sinema not budging, I mean, what, is, what are people supposed to do? I mean, there's ad campaigns in your state. I know there are billboards trying to get her to change her mind. There's, I spoke to Senator Schumer on this show yesterday. He claims to be having conversations ongoing to try and get everyone united. The fact is, Arizona needs HR1, and the filibuster is in the way of that. Can we all agree on that? I don't. I don't disagree with you. I don't have an answer for you on you know uh, how to change Cinema's position on that. Yeah, that's a shame. Uh, one last question before I let you go. Uh, there's the as a result of the census, uh, seats are being reapportioned uh, to different states. Uh, California's losing a seat. Uh, Florida's gaining seats. Uh, Arizona. Are you surprised that Arizona hasn't gained seats given the population change there? Yeah, certainly that was shocking news to most people um, in Arizona in the last hour or so. Um, so yeah, no, I think a lot of people are quickly scrambling to change their election plans for the 2022 election. 
Yeah, just uh, the, the chaos of elections in America never ceases to surprise me. Uh, Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs, thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. When we come back, President Joe Biden is far from a vegetarian. Just check the tape. You can see him hamming it up at burger joints and grills from El Paso to Iowa. But despite his carnivorous bona fides, the GOP is attempting to paint this man as a modern day ham burglar who wants to snatch the Big Macs right out of your mouths. They've been doing it for months, but it's gotten to be even higher stakes and without an ounce of truth this week. I'll explain after the break. Don't go away. We're not going to let Joe Biden and Kamala Harris cut America's meat. The Republican Party has gotten more and more absurd in its efforts to throw metaphorical red meat at its conservative base, feigning perpetual rage over fake culture war issues like the non-existent cancellation of Dr. Seuss or Mr. Potato Head, chewing over the stories in a loop on conservative media in lieu of, you know, real news. Well, now right-wing lawmakers and their shills in right-wing media are resorting to flinging actual red meat at the party faithful. No, really. We have entered the totally fake, completely meaningless war on red meat. Please sit down and have a serving, won't you? It all started when a British tabloid published a story that baselessly speculated about ways that Biden could cut US meat consumption in order to save the planet. The newspaper makes the suggestion that the Biden plan could force Americans to eat only one burger a month. Biden has suggested nothing of the kind. Despite that, conservative media here in the US picked up the story and ran with it. Fact checking be damned. One cable channel, you can guess which one, telling its audience of millions that the Biden administration would, would, not could, would be limiting Americans to eating only four pounds of red meat a year. He's up in your grill. Get it? Even former White House officials couldn't resist getting in on the erroneous story. To meet the Biden Green New Deal targets, America has to get this. America has to stop eating meat, stop eating poultry, fish, seafood, eggs, dairy, and animal-based fats. Okay, you got that? No burgers on July 4th. No steaks on the Barbie. I'm sure middle America is just going to love that. Can you grill those Brussels sprouts? So get ready. You can throw back a plant-based beer with your grilled Brussels sprouts and wave your American flag. I don't drink beer, but last time I checked, they were plant-based. Although cracking open a can of ice-cold beef stock on a hot summer's day after mowing the lawn does sound rejuvenating. Anyways, after the media pundits came the right-wing Republicans, of course they did, who include more easily manipulated folks like, you know, Lauren Boebert. Why doesn't Joe stay out of my kitchen? Asked the former supporter of QAnon, Congresswoman. What, no photo with guns? A missed opportunity there, Lauren. But also establishment figures like Governor Greg Abbott. Not gonna happen in Texas was what the, the governor of Texas said. And that, boys and girls, is how a war on meat is born. But how would such a conflict even work? Would the National Guard check burger ration cards outside every fast food drive through in the country to see if you've exceeded your quota? Man, this is a Wendy's, but not for you, not anymore. Look, hamburgers are delicious, that is a fact. Eat too many of them, though, and they can be detrimental to your health. 
That too is a fact, but it's a personal choice kept between you and your cardiologist. A specialty which conservatives are going to need in droves because they are literally going to give themselves heart disease to own the libs. Four pounds of meat yesterday? Just yesterday, Donny Jr.? Well, if that's true, it's not true. If that is true, what is wrong with you? Four pounds of meat in a day. I guess it's hereditary. Bon appetit, Don Jr. and Donald Sr. Look, what is true is that the production of all that red meat also has a huge environmental impact on land use, on water use, on air quality, on greenhouse gas emissions. But it is not Biden policy to take away your meat by force or law. What has changed, though, is that for the modern Republican Party, not just Donald Trump, brazen lying is the new normal. Up is down, black is white, and truth has been replaced by pure fiction. A newspaper can now make something up and the right-wing echo chamber can make it go viral, manufacturing fake outrage in a matter of days. And yes, today Fox News corrected their story, clarifying that Joe Biden is not coming for your meat. But for millions of Americans, the damage is already done. They already believe Joe Biden is the hamburglar. Good luck changing their minds. And look, this kind of serial lying is dangerous. Dangerous to democracy. And so I have to say, I liked it a lot better when the burger wars were between a clown and a king. Not this charade perpetrated by clowns who think this is how they can take down a president. You want fries with that? When we come back, Joe Biden is poised to go to Congress for his speech Wednesday night. But when will his Senate allies be forced to act on the filibuster? That's next here on Peacock. As we prepare for the Biden administration's 100-day mark in office this coming week, things are going pretty well for the president. His polling is good. He pushed through a massive COVID relief bill. His efforts to launch a mass vaccination campaign is paying real dividends. But a large Senate-sized wall to much of his agenda is on the horizon. And the president and his allies in the Senate have till now told us very little about what they plan to do about that, and specifically the Senate filibuster. That's the rule that requires 60 votes to move legislation forward in a chamber where there are only 50 Democratic votes. For decades, that rule, that filibuster, has been used to prop up racist laws and prevent progress. But right now, the Dems don't even have enough support within their own party to abolish it. So-called moderates like Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona are not budging. And that could be a huge roadblock for the president and his ambitious agenda. In Manchin's recent op-ed for the Washington Post, he wrote, Senate Democrats must avoid the temptation to abandon our Republican colleagues on important national issues. Republicans, however, have a responsibility to stop saying no and participate in finding real compromise with Democrats. But that's just what Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is counting on to lay the groundwork for filibuster reform. Republicans showing that they have no interest in working with Democrats. It's a point I discussed with Senator Schumer during our interview last night. 
you mentioned uh, a lot of bills are not covered by reconciliation. Some of the biggest issues in America today, immigration reform, uh, police reform, uh, climate change, uh, gun control, none of those can be done by re budget reconciliation. It's been widely reported that your plan is to put multiple bills for a vote on the Senate floor, have the GOP vote them down, filibuster them, and then reform the filibuster. But I wonder, how long can you wait to do that, Senator? What's your deadline? Because time isn't on your side. The For the People Act needs to be passed right now. Uh, and if even one elderly member of your caucus, God forbid, were to pass away or be incapacitated, you're no longer majority leader anymore. The Democratic majority could go tomorrow. So time isn't on your side. Uh, I agree we have to move quickly. I would say that the deadline for S-1 is a little longer than you say, uh, but it's probably by August or so. We're consulting the experts. When is the latest that S-1 can undo some of the despicable and, frankly, racist, racist changes that these Republican legislatures have made or are trying to make in the, uh, in the way people vote? Um, and so the bottom line here, Mehdi, is simple. We need unity. By definition, we need all 50. We're working hard to attain that unity. We've attained it on everything so far. On the major issues, whether we, when we had the minority, the three biggest issues were ACA, the tax, the horrible tax cuts of Trump, and uh, yeah. the impeachment. We were 100% united. On the three biggest issues so far here, uh, the president's cabinet, with one exception, which I regret, but everything else uh, with the impeachment trial and with ARP, we were united. I work hard to bring about that unity. And I have a leadership yes. team. I think I've mentioned this to you. We meet every uh, so Monday night at about a quarter to five, and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are on the team, and Joe Manchin and Mark Warner are on the team, and we discuss it, and we try to respect each other's positions. But so far, it has produced the kind of change that I think America needs. His deadline for HR1, the For the People Act, is August, as you just heard. Well, at least we have a date. But is that too late? And can we trust that Senate Democrats know what they're doing. Who better to ask than former Deputy Chief of Staff to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and author of the book Kill Switch, The Rise of the Modern Senate and the Crippling of American Democracy, Adam Gentleson. Thank you so much, Adam, for coming back on the show. White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain tells The Washington Post today that he heard Senator Schumer say last night on TV that his goal is to get H.R. 1 through the Senate this summer. That's a very strong goal and one we would join him in pursuing. What do you make of Schumer's August deadline and the Biden White House now getting behind it too? I think that's a very good deadline. Um, I think it would be bad if that deadline slips because, you know, when you say August in Senate speak, um, you're really talking about September because, of course, Congress usually goes home for all of August. Um, so if you don't pass it by August 1st, um, you're really talking about after Labor Day. And, you know, it's good for Congress to have deadlines. It, that is what it responds to. Without deadlines, it has a hard time getting anything done these days. Um, so it's very important that Senator Schumer uh, and Ron Klain are out there setting these deadlines publicly. I think that's, that's a great thing. Um, but I think it's important to keep that deadline because if you slip and you start getting past Labor Day, uh, yeah. things have a way of piling up at the end of the year. And then I think uh, you're in a, a tricky situation. I didn't realize I had so much in common with the United States Congress. I also need deadlines or things slip in my life. Uh, why do you think, Adam, that Schumer hasn't brought bills to the floor that the Republicans will filibuster right now? Uh, last week, he brought forward the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, important bill, which, of course, almost every single Republican senator voted for. Where are the bills that are going to put them on the spot, the popular bills on gun reform, um, uh, on, on democracy, if not democracy, then the range of issues, policing reform, et cetera. Where are those bills? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. You know, it, it looks like the bill on the floor right now this week is likely to also pass with bipartisan support. So we are poised to head into May with actually zero Republican filibusters so far, which is probably not the record of obstruction that, that a lot of Democrats were looking for. Um, <laughs> however, Indeed. that's... That's a zero because they've been very easy bills that have been put on the floor that have been easy to gain bipartisan support. So I think the question is, when are the, the harder choices going to come up? Um, hopefully that will happen right away when the Senate returns in May. But I think if the plan is to build a record of obstruction here or at least force Republicans to make some very tough choices, uh, that business has to start very soon. Yes, it does. And 
if it doesn't start, let's just be clear, can Democrats get anything done in a gridlocked Senate if they don't change the filibuster? Is budget reconciliation and executive action a substitute for real legislation on issues like the climate or gun reform or immigration reform? Well, it's a substitute on certain issues, but not on many others. Um, it's certainly not a substitute on democracy reform. Uh, you cannot pass HR1 through reconciliation. You cannot pass any voting rights legislation of any major scale through reconciliation as it currently stands. Um, it is not a substitute for action on gun control. Gun control can't pass through reconciliation. Probably a lot of on climate also can't pass through reconciliation. So reconciliation is at best a workaround. Uh, and if Biden is to achieve the agenda that he's laid out, HR1 that he has said he is committed to, that Senate Democrats have said they are committed to, then some kind of filibuster reform has to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it seems obvious. We've discussed it on this show many a time, including with you, but uh, still some people need to come on board, which I will come back to. Let me just ask you this. You were the Deputy Chief of Staff to former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. What's your response to Republicans who constantly say Harry Reid is the reason we're in this state right now because Dems under his leadership got rid of the filibuster for executive branch nominations and for lower federal court judges in 2013, and then the GOP under McConnell did it for the Supreme Court in 2017. Is that fair? You know, I'm, I'm always amused by that because, you know, what that supposes is that uh, when Democrats would start filibustering Trump's judges in 2017, uh, that Senator McConnell wouldn't have gone nuclear himself uh, and eliminated the filibuster right away. So I think that, you know, if you believe that Senator McConnell will do whatever it takes to advance his uh, political interests and his own political survival, I think you have a hard yes. time imagining that Senator McConnell would just let Democrats filibuster Trump's judicial nominees in 2017. I think he would have gotten rid of the filibuster right away, uh, and we would have gotten all of the same judges confirmed on the Republican side, and Democrats would have left been fewer Obama judges that we got confirmed uh, after we went nuclear. So I, I don't think we would have come out ahead in that calculation. And yet, and yet there are still so many people, including Senate Democrats, who are willing to give Mitch McConnell and the Republicans the benefit of the doubt that they wouldn't behave in the same way or worse if the situation was reversed. People are furious, for example, about the picture that Senator Kisten Cinema posted to Instagram last week of herself uh, wearing an F off ring. Uh, who do you think that was aimed at? And let me ask you the question I seem to be asking everyone on this show these days. What is her thinking, her game plan? Why are her and Joe Manchin so stubborn on this? So uh, I don't think I'm going to presume to get into Senator Sinema's head and guess guess who that was aimed at. But it certainly was aimed at someone because you don't uh, put that picture on social media if you're not trying to send a message. Um, look, I think, you know, the calculation here is that, uh, you know, it's always been a safe bet in the past that by defending the filibuster, you would earn lots of audits from the Beltway crowd uh, and lots of centrists, uh, Democrats and, and Republicans alike. But I think things have shifted on this issue. I think a, a consensus has built that Republican obstruction has gotten so extreme that filibuster reform is necessary. And I don't think Senator Sinema... Uh, um, calculated that, uh, you know, this is the position she wanted to be. And we've seen her approval rating drop 10 to 20 points in Arizona. I don't think that was her plan uh, to go into this year and spend the first five months of the year tanking her approval rating. So uh, I think, you know, some kind of a, a shift is going to have to come here. Um, she's too far out to the right for the people that she represents in Arizona. Um, so I think that there's going to be yeah. some kind of a shift uh, that comes down the road. So that's Kissed in Cinema. Let's talk Joe Manchin briefly. One of the things that came up in my conversation with Senator Schumer last night is I made the point that you've got six Democrats who are over the age of 70 in states with Republican governors. If, God forbid, one of them were to pass away tomorrow, that's it. Game over for the Democratic majority. I don't think people realize how tenuous uh, that majority is. Um, he conceded that point, but he also made an interesting point. He said, we could also lose that majority through defections. And I read that as him referring to, if you put too much pressure on Joe Manchin, he goes and joins the Republican Party. Do you worry about that as someone who's putting pressure on the likes of Manchin to move on the filibuster? I think Joe Manchin needs to be given some time here uh, to try to bring about this new era of bipartisanship that he called for in that op-ed that you uh, quoted earlier. I think if he can bring about that new era of bipartisanship, more power to him. Um, I think that would be a major achievement. However, if he can't, and I, he says this in the op-ed, he puts some responsibility on Republicans to come forward and cooperate. Uh, if that new era of bipartisanship is not forthcoming, uh, then he has to decide whether to be the person standing in the way of President Biden's agenda, whether he wants to be sort of one of the few people in Washington standing up and creating gridlock, uh, or whether he wants to get uh, on board with actually getting things done uh, and delivering results for West Virginia. I think that question has not been brought to a head yet, uh, but I think it's likely to come to a head uh, in the coming weeks and months. Last question for you, Adam. You worked for the last 
uh, Democratic Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. How much control does a Senate Majority Leader, the title is leader, but how much power and control do they have over their caucus? How much power does Chuck Schumer have with his flip phone right now? Explain to us. Yeah, it's a much softer uh, kind of power than in the House. Um, the Speaker in the House wields sort of almost dictatorial power. I'm not saying that about any specific person. That's just the nature of the job. Um, that is the power that is imbued in the, in the office. Uh, the Senate leader is a much softer kind of power. The position of Senate leader didn't even exist until the 1920s. The first person to actually give it power was Lyndon Johnson. Um, so it, it's more of a, a negotiation and a persuasion type of power. Um, however, I do think it is reasonable to expect a leader, with the stakes being as high as they are today, um, to be able to bring along a small handful of members of their own party uh, on issues that are as crucial as yes. the ones we're facing today. I think that's a fair expectation to make of someone who calls themselves the leader of a party in the House. Let's see what Chuck Schumer can do. Um, Adam Gentleson, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for your insights tonight. I appreciate it. Finally tonight, another day, another racist Republican outburst. Today, that honor goes to former Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum. We birthed a nation from nothing. I mean, there was nothing here. I mean, yes, we have Native Americans, but, if, but candidly, that... that there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. I shouldn't have to point out how ignorant and ugly that comment is, but humor me for a moment. First, it's ignorant because it was Santorum's old workplace, the U.S. Senate, that passed a resolution in 1988 saying the confederation of the original 13 colonies into one republic was influenced by the political system developed by the Iroquois Confederacy. And it's ugly because Santorum just brushes off the genocide of Native Americans. There was nothing here. Mm, yeah, there were people. You know, now that I think about it, this story about Santorum from former Obama speechwriter Cody Keenan suddenly makes a lot of sense. Santorum scoffed in disgust and got off the elevator at the next floor. While he was still in earshot, McCain raised his voice a little and said, don't mind him, he's an a-hole. I don't say this often, but right you were, John McCain. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook, and join us Wednesday night for Joe Biden's first presidential address to Congress. We'll be on the air for our usual show at seven and coverage goes until late into the night with myself, Zelina, and the crew from Morning Joe. And I'll see you here, back here, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. right here on Peacock. Good night.